Good afternoon. Okay, that was the first one. Good afternoon. Come on, you just had lunch. You can do better than that. Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, okay, well, we'll wake you up a little bit. Welcome to this session on smart, efficient infrastructure. I should tell you as we start that this uh, session is sponsored by Utility Shareholders of North Dakota. Please uh, thank them if you see them. I will also tell you that someone will be handing around evaluation at some point here. I would Lynette go. Ah, there she is. So she has these uh, magic slips of paper. Uh, you'll see them when you get them, and they're self-explanatory. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Chris Zimmerman. I'm with Smart Growth America, a national organization based in Washington, D.C., but we do work all around the country, uh, helping communities become better places to live. Uh, this session is inspired, obviously, by much of uh, what Governor Burgum spoke about this morning, uh, in particular the pillar that he calls smart, efficient infrastructure. And I would note that he has defined that as follows. Building smart, efficient infrastructure starts by examining the full costs, return on investment, and sustainability of all our growth patterns. From large metro areas to small towns, creating mixed-use centers and neighborhoods maximizes existing infrastructure, a clear economic benefit for taxpayers. This strategy of infilling existing spaces with diverse retail and housing opportunities reduces long-term costs for city government, benefits tourism and businesses, and fosters the kinds of creative spaces, arts, and culture that attract people of all ages. So in this session, we're gonna talk about some examples of the kinds of things that are being done around the state of North Dakota uh, to pursue this strategy and realize the benefits uh, that the governor identified. To do that, we have uh, a number of folks who are uh, actively on the ground implementing uh, some of these policies. And we're going to kind of go around. Um, I'm not sure I got people to sit in the order that I had them in, so that would have been easy, but I didn't think of that beforehand. So uh, let me just say first, and we'll let each person as they start tell you a little bit about themselves. But just briefly, we're going to start uh, first uh, hearing from Ellen Huber, who is a business development and communications director for the city of Mandan, from Jim Neubauer, who is the city administrator for Mandan, Ben Arith, who is a community development director for Bismarck, Daniel Nairn is a planner with the City of Bismarck. Kyle Gagner is financial advisor and developer and Cavalier. And Dave Carlsrud is mayor of Valley City. So, um, Ellen, do you want to start? I'm hoping that's actually the order these things are in. So, Jim will start. So I thought they were in the order. Let me see what order they're in, actually, in. which is the advance. OK, so that's definitely you. We're going to go the order the slides are in, because I think it'll be easier that way, <laughs> instead of you giving someone else's presentation. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Got it. All right, thank you very much. Uh, as Chris said, I'm Jim Neubauer. I'm the city administrator for Mandan. Um, today, Ellen and I, I think we have 10 minutes. So we'll go fast and furious through this. And with our infrastructure projects, if I can operate this right, First, but I will say that Ben and I are completely overdressed today. We should have had our tennis shoes and blue jeans and a jacket on, not ties and, and, and nice dress shoes. But we'll work with that. Um, one of the things in Mandan, if you don't know, we have a diesel fuel contamination problem in about six blocks of our downtown. And it had been going on since it was first discovered in 1985. One of, the image, one of the things that was going on in Mandan is that no one was willing to reinvest in property downtown, and banks were not willing to loan money to reinvest. So if Ellen wanted to put up a building downtown or buy a building and make improvements to her own building, a bank would not loan her money because they were worried about the contamination issue. If Ellen goes bankrupt, the bank's going to get the property back. Bank is going to have to then go in and clean up the property and clean up the mess. One of the big things that caused a severe decline in our downtown we, in 2002, 2003, we contracted with a firm called URS. URS came in and did a downtown redevelopment study. They said, you need to do several things. Restore the image of your downtown as a thriving, vibrant, central business district. You need to have an injection of capital to do that. You need to clean it up and green it up. It was really kind of a dirty, messy, dusty, a lot of parking lots downtown. 
make it more pedestrian friendly, encourage a mixed use development of both housing and businesses, generate critical mass for retail and restaurants, and a couple other things that they said were, you need to find a champion for your downtown. And through this process we did, that's when the city created the, the economic development director position in 2006. And also they said, you need to come to some resolution on the contamination downtown. In 2004, with the state of North Dakota and city of Mandan, we did settle with the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad for, um, we'll just go $24 million for the cleanup of our downtown area. You can see in the slide here, if you're looking up at the one on your left, red is bad, blue is not as bad, and the gray is okay, or kind of bad. We installed, um, in this six block area, we installed 300 remediation wells that each have a radius of 75 feet. We acquired several dilapidated properties, and in order to do that, the remediation trust, which was created with the settlement, um, had three main things. If the property was a benefit to the remediation project, therefore, if you had a piece of property and it would cost us um, $2 million to try and clean up, clean up around that property, or it cost us a half a million dollars to buy that property, tear it down, and clean it up, we were willing to make an offer. So it had to be a, a, a value to the project. We had to have a willing seller. We weren't going to condemn property and force people to sell property, and a reasonable price. If the property was worth $200,000 and they wanted $220,000, we'd probably pay them $220,000 for the property. So that allowed for a lot of our older dilapidated buildings to be torn down during that time period. A lot of people said, um, you're going to have nothing but parking lots forever. And you'll see as Ellen talks about some of the projects that we have been able to, done, to do, all of these lots we purchased and tore down buildings have been redeveloped either in multi-use projects or they've been parking for some of the housing units we've got downtown. So, um, one of the other things about our remediation project, it had three main goals. One, to protect human health. That was the number one thing. We wanted to make sure no one was getting sick. Number two, we needed to remove the free phase diesel product. And number three, we wanted to facilitate the redevelop in our downtown area. We've accomplished all those three goals, and I'm very happy to say at our 310th meeting of the Mandan Remediation Trust, which is the group that has had control of the money, we did ask the North Dakota Department of Environmental Quality, or DEQ, for a letter saying that our project is now complete. So we did that just a few weeks ago, and we'll wait to, wait to hear the results. Once we hopefully get a, a, a positive determination from the Health Department, or DEQ, we will then be able to transition into decommissioning our system. So with that, I'll let Ellen take over and talk to you about all the projects we've had go on because of the remediation in our downtown area. All right, well thank you, Jim. So I was hired as the business development director for the city of Mandan. It's very first in that role in 2006. But some of these things started um, before I launched my career with the city. And so Library Square was really the first infill um, development project of density. And this was in partnership with Metro Plains and brought affordable senior housing to the community. But they were the first to construct in the area of the remediation as well. And so their project and their ability to put in the vapor barrier that was necessary and build slab on grade and, and work through institutional control ordinances gave confidence to other developers that if Metro Plains could do this, they could do it too. And so um, this area was the first area where we had some single family housing and a former public library. And now we have um, you know, nearly um, 90 units of, of affordable senior housing. And then we learned as part of that URS study that we needed to put that commercial space at street level. So the first project was entirely housing. The second one has um, a considerable amount of commercial space, now the home of the Lewis and Clark Regional Development Group and an insurance agency. And, and Lewis and Clark has been an extremely important partner in this whole process. 
So our second project, and if you come along on tonight's creepy crawl downtown scavenger hunt or tomorrow's um, Three Pillars tour in Mandan, you're going to see some of these projects um, up close. But this was a quarter block where some buildings were removed to install remediation equipment. It allowed underground boring uh, uh, across Main Street rather than tearing up Main Street, but it left us with a quarter block that was being unofficially used as a parking lot. And so we went out with a request for proposals in um, about 2008, and uh, we did share this locally with developers and architects and engineers and anyone that, that might have interest, builders and the like, um, but we found that they weren't quite ready for this vision of density yet on a lot, which was really what we were seeking to go vertical here. And so we had to tr try it twice and go out and do some recruitment in um, other communities in North Dakota, particularly going to visit with developers in the Fargo and Grand Forks area where they had a little more familiarity with this type of product before we found someone that um, that put up this structure that's known as Mandan Place, and it's uh, 28 market rate apartments and um, also has street level commercial. The city did provide this property for a dollar, and along with that, Renaissance Zone benefits in years one through five, and tax increment financing in the form of a property tax exemption for years uh, six through 15. So this was kind of that very first project, and you're gonna see a trend where as we increased confidence and vitality in downtown Mandan, the incentives were um, able to be ratcheted down. It did take us longer to fill this commercial space than we would have liked, and also it took a lot of intestinal fortitude on the part of city leaders to say yes to this project because there was one other proposal that had come in from a, a financial institution in the community that's well regarded that wanted to put just a 3,000 square foot sort of um, suburban style branch bank on the lot that wouldn't have nearly covered the 16,250 square foot lot and would have been single story. So it, when we had people saying we need businesses in the community more so than buildings, it did take that longer term vision to get this project. Um, here's another one on the corner of Collins and Main, similar um, quarter block area where buildings were removed. And again, it took a couple of of rounds to, to get a project to move forward, but in this case, the property was sold for a dollar per square foot, or $16,250, and the incentive was just to renaissance zone on the commercial space for years one through five, and on the apartments only in years one through two. And we do have three businesses now in the street level commercial space of that property as well. And it was a, a HIF, um, affordable housing project for um, residents of all ages. And so here's a view when you see how these four projects, Library Square 1 and 2, um, Mandan Place, I guess I have got one of those mislabeled, would be farthest to my left, your right, and then Collins Place, how that came together to bring a lot of density, a lot of housing units to downtown Mandan. And then just a couple others real quickly. We had a former grain elevator, I think something a lot of communities can relate to in the state that was no longer viable with the unit train trend and that um, ele elevator had gone defunct. Um, we were able to get the elevator property donated to the city by Burlington Northern Santa Fe and get some retail in that location. This was an opportunity, I think, before we really knew a lot about smart efficient infrastructure and the benefits of density and maybe were maybe a little too quick maybe to take the first proposal that came our way, but this is um, the infill project that we have in that location. And then just on a smaller scale, we've had a couple of lots along Main Street that um, at least in my 50 years of living in the community had never been built on, and so here was an example of a local accounting firm doing an infill project, a renaissance zone project, and expanding. And then this one's not infill, but it's certainly use of existing infrastructure. We had a former junior high school that had sat vacant for many years, and, um, and it was really an example of try, try, and try again. And uh, when the Commonwealth companies of Fond du Lac, Wisconsin came on the scene, they were the ones able to work through all of the historic tax credits and work with the North Dakota Housing and Finance Agency, get this on the National Registry of Historic um, Places, and, and create this $8 million project with 39 units of affordable housing. 
So um, with that, we'll turn it over to the next speaker and, and again encourage you to participate in either the fun tour or the informational tour and uh, we'll promise not to have you out in the cold for very long. We're going to really bounce from building to building on those tours. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to talk about the Renaissance Zone program in the city of Bismarck. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with this program already. It is a tax incentive um, program intended to spur on revitalization of the core of the community in terms of new construction and rehabilitation of existing buildings. Uh, in Bismarck, we have had a program since 2001. We've had over 140 different projects approved. So we really have a trove of data we can look into to see the effects of this program over the years. I'm going to focus exclusively on fiscal impact. There's a lot of perspectives we could use to evaluate this, but we're asking the basic question, does the initial investment from the city in terms of the five years of exempted property tax pay for itself over time uh, with the increased valuations? So just to tie this into our, the theme of our um, day today, the efficiency of infrastructure, uh, this was covered more eloquently this morning, but just to show that we're talking about the amount of people served by existing facilities that are in place. So that is one way to increase the infrastructure efficiency. Uh, this map shows the city of Bismarck, uh, the property tax evaluation per acre of land. So you see the areas in red that are extruded to the higher level. Those are the more tax efficient parcels. Uh, if we zoom into the downtown area, we see uh, many of the most tax-efficient parcels in the city are part of our Renaissance Zone. So this is the blue uh, area that you see. This is the current Renaissance Zone boundary. The one exception may be the southeast portion of a Renaissance Zone, which is just added over this summer. So we do hope to see in the years to come those yellow parcels turning into red and, and uh, orange, maybe red in the future as uh, investment does take shape. The... Um, this is, this is to give you a little bit of an example of some of the logic behind the uh, tax um, advantages of, the, of this program. This is a, a fairly modest um, investment that occurred uh, in 2006. It was a Renaissance Zone project at that point. The property owners put about $700,000 into this building. Uh, and it was exempted from property tax taxation on the building for five years. And so the city did lose thirty to $60,000 in revenue, depending on whether you think the project would have occurred otherwise. Um, uh, but when the property did re-enter the tax rolls in 2012, uh, the city, the county, the schools, and parks all... Um, now generate about $15,000 per year in top property tax revenue from that, um, from that building. So, and that is each year going on forward. So you can see the initial investment recouped in just a few years, and then from now on, uh, we get the benefit of that investment. Uh, many of our projects, um, although we have had several new construction, fairly large projects in the city of Bismarck, many of them are smaller scale investments in existing buildings that have allowed entrepreneurs, new small businesses to occupy um, buildings that are already uh, in place. So we've seen these incrementally occur over time in the city and build up the tax base um, gradually. The, when you look at the entire cumulative effect of this program, uh, the entire valuation of the Renaissance Zone area was about $80 million when the program started. It is now over $200 million. Uh, and as you would expect, the properties that took part in the program um, grew the fastest at a little over 12% per year in, in growth. Uh, but even properties that were not invested into and did not receive a tax exemption also grew in value of about a little lesser amount, but about 4% per year. So we do see a rising tide effect as the uh, properties in the surrounding area improve. Uh, it does create benefits for everybody else as well. Just to look forward, um, we do have $20 million worth of investment that has been approved but has not been built yet, that it's in the design and construction phase. So we do, you know, I've been talking about the previous history of this program and the 20 years of examples we have, uh, but we do have more in the future in store and we're excited to see the, the changes in downtown as a result. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hello. Hi, everyone. How many of you live in a community of less than 5,000 people? Show of hands, please raise them high. Great. 
my uh, conversation will mean nothing to the most of you because you all live in larger communities. These projects are fantastic that happen in large communities. Believe it or not, in, across the United States, the majority of communities are made up of about 5,000 people or less. So small towns actually are the majority. Most of the people live in the big communities, but there's a lot of small towns. So how do you spur on development in a small town? I come from Cavalier, North Dakota, northeastern North Dakota. Remember Pemina County, greatest county in the state? We have 1,200 people that live up there, and we have a main street like a lot of you, a lot of dilapidated buildings, a lot of projects that could use some infill. I'm just a guy that decided to do it. Somebody asked me today, what do you do, Kyle? I'm a doer. A lot of people talk, 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 and nothing gets done. I like to get things done. It doesn't always get done, but I'd prefer they get done. I don't like to just talk about things. What I do during the day that makes money, that's just a part of life. I'm a doer. So this is a building that was built in 1905 on Main Street Cavalier. It was built as a bank, First National Bank, and that was somebody's car and somebody's family. It's probably a really special moment for them. But what we did is we took this old building... Uh, when I moved to town, I moved to town in 2010, it looked like this. It was a big dump. It had been empty for a while. Nothing had been done. So we took it, uh, bought it for cheap, and turned it into mixed use. We put in uh, retail space, office space, and two apartments upstairs. I'm not sure how this is going to work here. Oh, yeah, there's a bike shop in the back. And the guy that runs the bike shop actually happens to be the world's fastest football padded pastor. That's also real, if you want to look it up, if you don't believe me. The other thing we did is just recent, I put together this dramatic video. I'm hoping it rolls. So I'm going to actually just lend to you guys back there. I'm not going to move forward because there's some audio. So go ahead and roll that video if you could. If that doesn't get you pumped up, I don't know what. I mean, here you got Mandan guy. They're like, oh, yeah, the last building project was $50 million, and this was 30 So no disrespect. That's awesome and fantastic. I'm like, hey, look what we did. So we get excited about that. We should all get excited. And that's why we're here. That's why we gather together. That's why we collaborate, whether it's a small project like ours or these big projects that are happening in Mandan and Valley City and in Bismarck. It's awesome. North Dakota is awesome. Gil is awesome. That guy was awesome. He got me stoked. I'm not going to, I'm going to quit talking about the 20 days that suck in North Dakota when it's like 55 below zero and it hurts to breathe. I'm going to start talking about all the good days. I'm going to start talking about the good things that happened in Cavalier and in Mandan and in Bismarck and in hopefully in your communities as well. So I'm just hopefully here to encourage you guys to do something. If you've got a project you're thinking about doing, do it or get somebody else to do it. Hello, everyone. Hey, Jim. <clears throat> My feet feel good. <laughs> if feet don't feel good, nothing feels good. And, and I volunteered to be one of the uh, shorter pre presenters here, so we'll get, we'll get to it, all right? And uh, uh, Valley City uh, isn't as far along with the building projects and so forth as some of the others. Uh, we had some events in uh, 2009, 10, and 11 that uh, had we lost the flood fight, it would have cost us about $120 million. And so uh, at that time, uh, there was a sales tax referendum. Uh, approximately, I think, a half percent sales tax went into effect. And we've been working on permanent flood protection. Oh, 
Well, that doesn't look like us. That's Ben. So how are we doing so far? <laughs> okay. We'll just pretend I don't have any, any uh, PowerPoint, and we'll sail along. So uh, we, we have been working diligently on permanent flood protection, and I would share with you we had minor flooding uh, at 15 feet flood stage at, at Valley City, and we didn't have to make a sandbag this year. Uh, it, but that's, first of all, I can't take credit. I've only been mayor three years. And, and the other thing is, uh, without uh, Department of Commerce, you know, without uh, DOT, and uh, without the uh, State Water Commission, we're nowhere. So, so we're very grateful to, to those entities. And we have, we have today uh, uh, a situation where when the timing was just right, we were able to mingle or meld our permanent flood protection with our Main Street Initiative. So you have, have, uh, uh, we were able to have the same brickwork on our permanent flood protection along the river. There was a picture at, at the uh, uh, session this morning as there is along the brickwork of the old buildings. Okay. And then we were able to take the, the lighting and make it the same as what we just did. And then uh, we had permanent flood, excuse me, permanent flood protection around our, our park. So we have, have uh, partnered with our park district and we will be putting lighting down in there because it got pretty secluded when, when uh, the walls were put up. In, and as far as, as a, an accidental benefit from flood walls, uh, we had to put flood walls around the university. The university is quite low, and it made a campus. It closed it off, and it just finished the campus, which made it, made it very, very beautiful. We, we are blessed to be in a beautiful area, a uh, good geographic location. Uh, we invite you to stop in and visit. Maybe you'll find a place you like and you want to hang out there for a while. Um, but I know, we're, Chris, we're short of time. And uh, we'll maybe if you have other questions about what we're doing and uh, when Ben gets going, uh, we would entertain that. So uh, thank you very much. I'm going to check the, uh, make sure we actually have your slides up. Um, I will say, um, Mayor, you said you've only been mayor three years. Yes. So you weren't going to take credit. Are you planning to run again? I just did. <laughs> So, so do take credit. I was an elected official for 18 years, let me tell you. Take any credit they give you, because they will blame you for the stuff that somebody else did, too. So, uh, is this yours, Ben? Okay, great. Hi. <laughs> okay, I think I'm up. Third time's a charm. I, I, I guess I'm the last one, so I knew this was going to be me. So, once again, I'm Ben Arith. I, I work for the city of Bismarck. Uh, I'm going to be taking a little bit different perspective. These are all hard acts to follow, um, but I'm, I'm going to be uh, maybe raising it up to another elevation in terms of the, the scope. I'm going to be talking more about policies, planning level policies that, that the city of Bismarck um, ha has been working on to, to aid and support smart and, smart and efficient infrastructure in our community. So a little bit about Bismarck uh, to give you some context. Right now we're uh, at a population of around 73,000. Uh, by 2040, over the next 20 years, we're projected to grow another 20,000 people, so up to around 95,000. What does that mean from a geographic footprint perspective? So right now Bismarck, uh, in terms of square miles, we consume around 30 square miles uh, within our corporate limits. If we grow in the same way we have been growing in terms of consuming the same amount of land that we have been consuming over the past several decades, we'll be adding another roughly 20 square miles of land within the next 20 years to the corporate limits of Bismarck. So many of you are familiar with the area. You're here right now. You understand that there's some natural and man-made constraints that's, that's going to make the outward expansion tougher and tougher as the years go by. So finding 
um, tools uh, and, and ways to grow in a more efficient manner are, are uh, near and dear to our hearts and important to us to consider. So back in 2014, some of those uh, tools that, that we utilize uh, come from uh, a growth management plan that was developed in 2014. Two key tools that came out of that plan uh, might not be new and innovative to some communities, but uh, Bismarck is actually relatively new to the land, future land use planning game. And so uh, we identified uh, the future land use uh, plan of uh, within and the surrounding community to identify where, uh, what types of uses should go where. But the second important piece to that is, is the image uh, on, on your right, uh, which is uh, what we call our growth phasing plan. So the, the future land use identifies where those, those uses are gonna grow in the future in our community and the growth phasing plan sort of identifies the priority areas or the, those next uh, most uh, likely areas to develop and extend infrastructure into. And, and so these concepts really relate to, to development uh, on the, the edge of the community or the outward expansion. Um, in 2017, we, we undertook uh, and, and completed uh, what we called an infill and redevelopment plan. So Bismarck, like many other communities probably in North Dakota, has the, our zoning and subdivision regulations have evolved into to more of a suburban scale uh, type of uh, regulations that um, perhaps make, make development on the edge a little bit easier. But if, if you're trying to redevelop or develop within the interior of the community, those same zoning and subdivision regulations uh, don't match the existing character of the community. So this plan identified a, a number of, of different policy changes that, that we needed to consider and have already started to undertake to make development within the heart of the community uh, a little bit easier. Uh, we're also sort of dipping our toe into the water about looking into the future and thinking about uh, through a scenario planning process. So many of the researchers that we've been uh, watching um, believe autonomous self-driving vehicles, for instance, is a reality. I think there's the jury's still way out on exactly when that's going to happen and in what form that's going to happen. As, as, as the previous speaker, Gil Pelosi, uh, indicated, you know, it could be great for our communities, it, it could be terrible for our communities. And so we're just starting to think about that right now. The, our Metropolitan Planning Organization undertook a scenario planning effort where uh, we gathered a group of, of stakeholders from the local communities to, to try to think through and understand what might a, a fully autonomous future look like for the community in the next 20 years, because some of the experts are saying that it's possible that within the next 20 years, the majority market penetration for, for how people are getting around in our communities could be through autonomous self-driving vehicles. And so we're trying to prepare and think what that means to our community form, what that means to our transportation system and the infrastructure that has to serve that. Recently, we undertook uh, more specific policy uh, level actions. We undertook uh, uh, changes to our roadway width and right-of-way width design standards. So we, we uh, several members, uh, several departments within the community worked with uh, stakeholders, primarily from the local uh, development uh, community. And we came up with a variety of options, which, which our commission recently adopted a few, few months back. One of those options is probably a more conventional uh, suburban style uh, roadway right away width standard of, of 38 feet curb face to curb face. Um, Second, uh, second option, we, we looked at uh, a 32-foot wide roadway, or we allow for a 32-foot wide roadway, curb face to curb face. And, and the, the, the third option, we actually uh, would allow for a 26-foot wide roadway, curb face to curb face, with, with parking restricted to, to one side of the street only. Um, so we thought of this as, kind of saw this as a win, 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 a win from the, for the development community. They're happy, they have lower input costs, and when they're developing newer, particularly newer parts of the community, hopefully those costs get passed on to the end consumer. Um, it also allows them more flexibility in how they wanna design neighborhoods. Um, it's a win for the city of Bismarck. Um, we, we now have a consistent boulevard spacing, so we have a, a minimum area that we need uh, for our street trees, for sidewalks, for underground infrastructure, for snow storage. And we see it as a win for the overall community as well. Um, I, I think we believe that this creates, the, especially the narrower roadway width standards, create a more pedestrian-friendly environment and, and arguably uh, lead to better uh, quality urban design. 
The last thing I'll talk about is something that, uh, that's in the works for us right now, and, and that's a full-scale rewrite of our parking code. Um, so parking over the last five years uh, has been one of the more dominant or one of the most requested variances from our, from our current zoning regulations. Um, it, it's, uh, it, it's a big, literally a big part of Bismarck. It, it, and just looking at the commercial areas in Bismarck, parking in those areas consumes about four square miles in Bismarck. So it's, it's literally a, a big impact on our community. That's about 50% of how that land in those commercial areas is used. And so we see by modifying these, these uh, parking requirements that we currently have, um, it could contribute to uh, better impacts related to stormwater runoff. We know that parking is often a barrier to, to more affordable uh, forms of, of housing in the community. And so we're working with a stakeholder group to try to, try to find a balance uh, between maybe a more of a market-driven approach while still trying to protect uh, some of the spillover effects that, that may be caused by neighboring properties and, and neighborhoods. And, and Chris, that's, that's, uh, that's it for me. Thanks. You've already given me several additional questions to add to the list that I've made, and we won't have enough time, but let me ask you quickly, what's the square mileage of uh, Bismarck altogether? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, right now we're at about 30, 30 square miles. And four square miles of that is surface parking? Right. Yeah, and that's just, that's just looking at the commercial areas in town. I, I wish I could say that that was like bad for America, but actually that's fairly typical. So we have an extraordinary amount of space occupied by surface parking and uh, preventing exactly the kind of you know, info development you're trying to get. Which brings me to my uh, next question, which was, uh, I, I like the graphic you showed in particular of the current footprint of the, of the city and what it would be if you expand, if you accommodate the additional population of, with the pattern that you've had up till now. Uh, and your plan, of course, is to not do that. Um, what makes the outcome different than just growing out? And basically, how do you, how do you enforce a plan that uh, aims to have the development occur in an infill pattern, rather? Yeah, one of the, uh, thanks for asking that, Chris. One of, the, one of the tools that I think we're using right now is that, that growth phasing plan. Um, so um, that, that uh, staff works, looks at uh, annually at where growth has occurred, where infrastructure is, and identifies sort of priority areas for growth for the outward expansion of the community. Um, and and it, it sort of identifies those areas where it's most cost effective to extend services into, and those are areas that we as a city may choose to partner and help extend services into those areas. Any, any development beyond those priority areas, as we call it, um, are fully funded by the developer, and so the city typically would not participate in those. Um, I'll, I'll say also Daniel and, and uh, Will and our GIS department uh, and others on our, on our planning team have also developed a, a tool we call our, our vacant parcels tool, and so um, we've got a fair amount of vacant undeveloped property within, within the community already that's already served, and this tool is accessible on our website. Um, folks can whether you're a developer or, or just an interested citizen or, or a geek like me who likes to look at this stuff, you can, you can look at this tool and, and you can query out by size of parcel, by zoning district, and, and so forth, and, and find a, sort of a wealth of undeveloped properties that, that may be a more likely target um, that's, that's already served by infrastructure within our, within our corporate limits. Very good. And Daniel, uh, you know, part of this, of course, is making things happen where you want them to happen, and that's part of what you're trying to do with the Renaissance Zone program, I want to ask the question that is sort of uh, somewhat provoked by uh, the slide you showed with the graph of the benefits over time, and you sort of said it yourself. Um, you're providing, essentially to incentivize this, you're providing some tax benefit to a property owner who's doing something uh, to revitalize there, and you know that, that produces clearly greater benefits over time, assuming it wasn't going to happen anyway. And that's always the question with these kinds of programs. How do we know that the development, that whatever was done, would have would not have happened otherwise. Uh, how do you deal with that? Yes, thank you. That that's a question that our authority takes pretty seriously. In fact, um, 
I guess I should say there's no way to know for sure, but one thing that we do is when we're vetting projects, we do ask um, the applicants a pretty simple question, what would, would you do this if we did not grant you this incentive? And, you know, we get a variety of answers. Um, in some cases, they say, no, you know, I'm, I'm right on the margins here, and, and I really would not go forward at all. Sometimes they may say, um, I, you know, I'd build something, but I'd have to scale it down quite a bit, or I don't know if I can get the financing and the investment that I need for this to go forward. It's a risk that, you know, I don't know. So we don't know that uh, for sure. I think one practical step we take to try to maximize our effectiveness is to have the conversation as early as possible in the developer's decision-making process. So they haven't already, you know, acquired their vet investment. They don't have all of their designs necessarily finalized. We want this to be something that's pushing them forward in their decision making. And does the program at some point expire or does the zone become one where you don't need to incentivize any longer? Sure. It, it, we have a five we have five year um, agreements with the that, state that's for the project, but I meant oh. in general. Oh, yeah, the whole program itself um, has a five year agreement with the Department of Commerce and then I believe it is twenty twenty two I think is when we would be up for our next so it could continue, but we don't know if it will. So the reason I'm asking is that I can imagine situations, this is fairly typical, where you have a street where you think if something would happen, other things would happen, and that's why we want to incentivize it, right? So we, we give some benefit to a few, and it starts, and it, now the person who's been waiting, who's in between the two properties that have you know, benefited, well, their property's now worth more, and they have an incentive to do it on their own. Mm -hmm. um, there's no point in paying them, you know, taxpayer money to do it. Uh, so some programs, you know, expire. So if you're the first ones to take advantage of it, great, because you're the pioneer. After that, the market takes over. That was the, the general uh, thought I had. Uh, let me uh, go around the table here a little bit, so to speak. Um, I wanted to ask a couple of questions about how you decide to uh, invest in certain kinds of infrastructure programs. Well, let me take a specific example. In, uh, in Mandan, where you have both uh, necessary infrastructure to deal with problem like you know flooding and that sort of thing stormwater and then you have projects what you're trying to do is reinvigorate your downtown getting new residents with those housing projects those things are clearly related in order to do one you really had to do the other um, can you talk a little about either of you um, what is what kind of thinking goes into that one coordination is there and the decision to say we're gonna put a lot of money into infrastructure here because we want to do the other thing um, good question. Um, those questions, I think, are not unique to Mandan. I think they're every community across country is mm -hmm. where do you prioritize your money. Right. Um, in Mandan, we've tried to develop a street maintenance program um, where we have several areas in our downtown core district that are in the, the streets have not been probably redone since they were first put in 50, 60 years ago. And so we've developed a program to try and move in a logical manner in that will be as least disruptive to those property owners in that area by moving from, I think, our east to our west and taking maybe 10 blocks at a time and knocking those out. Maybe we might have to take a year break and then we'll move to the next project and move those. So um, the, the funding for those has been a challenge because they are older neighborhoods and you have um, developed properties and the, you may not have curb or gutter or anything left. You may not have stormwater and it's a matter of saying with I think you heard this morning a little bit about the Prairie Dog Funds. Those are going to go to help um, buy down part of those projects in those older parts of town. And we're doing right, one right now where we are using about uh, $1.5 million of Prairie Dog money to buy down 20% of those special assessment costs to those landowners. And again, it's an older part of town that has really never had, a, had an improvement project in there before. Do you look, do you look at all at, uh, we saw the diagram with the hot spot. Uh, that basically shows what places in town are generating more revenue. Um, do you ever look at that side of things? An indicator of economic activity, where things are happening, where there's a higher return on investment? Maybe just more simplistically speaking, one of the things that we looked at in Mandan is we were very much becoming a bedroom community to the capital city of Bismarck, and we knew that our commercial property tax base was only about 25% of our total valuations. And so by putting our foot a little bit on the gas pedal and making commercial development more of a priority in these mixed use developments in downtown and so forth, we now have that I think at 33% when we last checked. So we're making significant progress in that regard by putting more priority on, on that sort of development. And that makes your homeowners a lot happier when they're not carrying the whole bill on the, on the homeowner's tax. Exactly, much more sustainable approach. Yeah. 
So I'd like to now go to, uh, I, I want to ask the same question from a political perspective for the mayor, but also from a private sector uh, perspective. Uh, in doing these things, um, in the various things we're talking about that are about trying to get uh, infill done, get you know revitalization of places that maybe at one time have had economic activity uh, that you're trying to bring back into it. What is the biggest obstacle you find? Cave people. <laughs> people against everything. Okay, so citizen opposition. Okay, all right. If we might step back just a second. Sure. Spend some time talking about the the uh, uh, flood protection that we've been doing. That has that has retarded the Main Street initiatives and and the infill in Valley City. We're reaching a point now where where we can begin. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would give a shout out to the Main Street Initiative. We did a, a uh, five block uh, stretch of uh, improvement. And how many of you have utilized Main Street Initiative program? Not many. I if you're thinking about it, gosh, try it. I will tell you that it is wonderful. Uh, we could not have done anything with our with our Central Avenue without it. And uh, the point is, it works. Uh, we have, we have uh, two new stores that uh, were the people repurposed in old, old buildings. And we've had uh, extensive uh, face front lifting, store, excuse me, storefront lifting uh, on uh, three other stores completely on their own. They haven't even applied for help. And so the attitude in our community is that of more pride than we had uh, leading into the project. Very good. So, so I, I really can't go into uh, the, uh, your, your question because we aren't there yet. Kyle, from the standpoint of an entrepreneur, if you were going to do this again, uh, if you're going to do any more of it, what would you say is the biggest uh, obstacle to overcome? Money. <laughs> but to what you had asked Daniel, Daniel, uh, these programs do really propel projects forward, mine mm -hmm. included. Uh, again, mine's just a small project. And again, no disrespect, the 50 million, like what you guys have going on is spectacular. Everything that's going on is spectacular. But these programs really do take it over the edge. And I, I, it is a bummer that you guys never get to see, perhaps, that side of things, of whether or not that's what makes it. I know you asked the question. You probably get a fake answer because they're trying to get your money. But really, there's, for me, it's those programs and those things that augment the project. Uh, it's the Bank of North Dakota, the only state-owned bank in the country. North Dakota is awesome for a lot of reasons. So it's all those things that you guys are talking about, all these things that we're talking about here. It's really this Main Street initiative. That's what makes things happen, and that's what probably would prevent things from happening. If we weren't doing this, stuff would not be happening, and our Main Streets would probably be getting worse. So all this that's happening is the opposite. So financing a project, though, I mean, that's really what you were getting at. Always, was, yeah. I mean, making it, it really, if you have a community that doesn't have a lot of uh, revenue driving from whatever area, then it's going to be hard to make things happen. And the other thing, too, is from my standpoint as a developer, property values, if I'm going to invest a ton of capital in a project in a smaller community, to me it's worth a lot, but to the market it's worth nothing. And so you've got to have that longevity approach, too. I know I'm, I'm only going to live in Cavalier for forever. So <laughs> it's those that aren't that it's hard for them to invest because if they're not going to live there forever, they have no incentive because the market value on the other side of the development sometimes is a little daunting. But again, once you start, hopefully that improves. That graph goes up and the tide rises. So if you can overcome citizen opposition and if you come up with lots of money and you have a great plan, you can do great things. Do you have any money we can have? Uh, sorry. Okay, just um, checking. <laughs> I have about a dozen more questions, but no time to ask them. So I'd just like to ask all of you to join me in thanking our panelists.